Welcome everybody to the Open Ventilator uh, Remote Monitoring Project. Um, this was a project uh, that we did. Uh, the open source community came together uh, to create software to remotely monitor um, uh, do-it-yourself rapidly manufactured ventilators um, during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, so by way of introduction, um, my name is Sam Cervantes. I'm the Chief Technology Officer at Maker Gear 3D Printers based out of Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, and also uh, leading the project with me is Dave Guffrey. Uh, he's the Medical Device Cybersecurity Program Manager at Mass General Brigham Healthcare. So uh, we're going to give you a little description of our project, what we did, and um, uh, how we went about it. So uh, over to you, Dave. Okay. So this is kind of, this has been the year of COVID. We've all been impacted by this global pandemic. And early on in this pandemic, there was fears of massive shortages of ventilators. For example, Governor Cuomo of New York predicted there would be 26,000 people who could die from ventilator shortages. In Italy, they stopped intubating patients over the age of 60, and the New England Journal of Medicine predicted a need of anywhere from 160,000 to over a million. So there's a global pandemic. Early on in this, Massachusetts is hit pretty hard by this as far as the United States is concerned. Mass General Brigham is the largest healthcare provider in Massachusetts and has a significant need for ventilators. So Mass General Brigham reaches out to the tech community to develop new technologies, new processes, and has to be rapidly deployable in order to meet this predicted growth in rate of infections. And you need to do this in a massively condensed timeline. So a typical medical device development takes two to three years. This needed to be done in two to three weeks. Crazy. So Mass General Brigham reaches out to the open source community to develop rapid prototype ventilators. Open source community responds. This is an example of just some of the resources that the open source community has provided. And Sam is gonna go into this in more detail later in this presentation. So now you have the open source community at, at the ready. Working groups are starting to form to develop hardware systems, control software, and remote monitoring software. All of these are being done in parallel under this condensed timeline. So what's the initial need and scope of this project? So you have this predicted ventilator shortage. You have a need for these rapid prototype ventilators that the community is now building. However, most of these ventilators lack built-in monitoring. And clinical representatives need to have central monitoring express this need to have central monitoring similar to central nursing station networks. So in a hospital, you typically would have like a GE network or a Philips network or a neon coding network or some other monitoring network where you have bedside monitor, bedside physiological monitors going out and you have a network where you can go back to a central nursing station and oversee the data and the alarms of all of these patient rooms. And you have ventilator systems that can then plug into these bedside monitors to jump onto this network. And then you can monitor these ventilator systems as well. Well, you can't do that with these rapid prototype ventilators. So you have these open source teams actively developing these ventilators. And now you need to have remote monitoring and central monitoring of these systems. That's where this team comes into, into play. And it initiated in April 2nd of 2020. So what's the clinical request and the need for this remote monitoring software? So you have this rapid prototype ventilator groups, they're not integrated into central monitoring traditionally with hospitals. So you need a method of monitoring of all your ventilators on a given floor or a given unit. You have to have a central dashboard with visual learning that's easily interpretable. You have to be able to ingest device data from all these ventilators. So not just your patient device data, but also device status data and alarm states and alarm data from ventilators if, if available. And again, you have to do this in this wicked condensed timeline of two to three weeks, and you shouldn't cause patient harm or interruption in patient care, because if you do that, you're defeating the purpose of helping clinical staff, and instead you're getting in the way and potentially causing patient harm. So this is where Sam's company, Maker Gear, comes into play. They have a 3D printing company, and they have software that has the ability to integrate with physical hardware as well as providing a centralized dashboard. So this was the initial code base that was hacked and adapted by the remote monitoring team to develop this ventilator monitoring system. So now what happens is we're actively developing all of these rapid prototype ventilators and the remote monitoring team is working on integrating with these ventilator te teams in order to build a central monitoring system. 
However, simultaneously, hospitals are procuring ventilators left and right. You're trying to build up your ventilator inventory from traditional commercial vendors. And what happens is there was not a need to then deploy these rapid prototype ventilators because you're sharing up your inventory of already off the shelf commercial ventilators. And the problem though is a lot of these new ventilators may not have been the same model that you already built out integrations for. And so the amount of time to design these integrations was extremely costly, resource intensive, and you just can't do that in an emergency response situation. So you have new commercial ventilators that can't integrate into your central monitoring system. On top of that, you have infection control restrictions because this is a global pandemic. So you have closed doors for infection control reasons. You have ventilators inside of these rooms that can't be centrally monitored. And now you have alarms going off with these ventilators. Now clinical staff are having trouble hearing alarms through these closed doors. So this is where our team now pivots and we are requested to create a method for monitoring these commercial ventilators in a central means that don't typically integrate with the other traditional central monitoring systems. So what's our plan of attack? So MGH Biomed, for example, researched off-the-shelf sound monitoring solutions. So they vected in on one product, the sound ear. So the sound ear is, can deploy a one-to-one -one system per patient room, per ventilator. It's a self-contained consumer off-the-shelf system that can monitor sound pressure. So you can hook a, hook a sound ear with a microphone up to the speaker on the ventilator that, that auditorily alerts the alarm. And then when the sound pressure is exceeded, when that alarm goes off, the sound ear can then trip. So we were then requested to integrate with this sound ear and provide a central means for monitoring the sound ear and be able to create a central dashboard for when it trips. And now I'm gonna pass it over to Sam to go into the architecture. Thanks, Dave. Uh, um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the technical aspects of the project and, and how we went about uh, pulling, on, pulling this off. Uh, and then also uh, later on, uh, some of the kind of the future goals. So uh, this right here, this is the user interface for the clinician. Uh, this is the whole goal of the entire project right here. Uh, so this is what the, the nurse is gonna see at the nursing station. Uh, we've got one little box here for each ventilator. So we've got, uh, in this case, 48 ventilators uh, monitored with, from our single dashboard. So this is every ventilator on the entire floor of the hospital uh, monitored from, from one central dashboard. Um, so we've got three states uh, of a ventilator right here that we can display. Um, uh, the normal state, the happy state is green. Uh, that means uh, we're able to ping the ventilator. We're getting a good status report back and there's no alarm, uh, all is good. Uh, the second state is, is this gray uh, strike through box right here. Uh, that means um, we're not able to even connect with the ventilator. So a technician needs to go check on the ventilator. Uh, so there's a fault in the system somewhere. The third state is, uh, is this red box here and that'll actually flash, you'll see in the live demo. Uh, and that means um, an alarm is currently being triggered on the ventilator so the nurse needs to go check on it. So at a glance, the nurse can see right here, okay, I need to go check uh, on two different ventilators right here, room seven and room four, uh, I need to go check on those. Uh, okay, so how do we go about doing this? Uh, typical uh, deployment uh, process for software like this is two to three years. We had two to three weeks, COVID-19 emergency. Uh, so how do we go about pulling this off? Uh, basically, we had to pull all the rapid prototyping uh, software development strategies. Uh, we had to move fast and break things. We rely heavily on the open source community and the maker communities, distributed development. We had distrib um, software developers all over the country uh, pushing to our GitHub repo. And we had to hack and fork existing products to get something out uh, in just a few weeks. We use things like 3D printing and quick turn PCBs, off the shelf hardware to, to get something that we could barely quickly snap together, bolt together, and ship a solution to our customers uh, in just a very short amount of time. Uh, we had to rely on remote lab testing, uh, and as much as we could, um, you know, source locally. Component sourcing was a, was a key uh, thing here. We had to design our system uh, around the components that we could actually source that were in stock and locally available. Uh, we might have wanted to use a PLC or a custom uh, circuit board, uh, but we didn't have time. So we had to use things like off the shelf Raspberry Pis and Arduinos 
that we could that we could get in quantities of thousands uh, that were actually in stock. Um, uh, so basically, we had to move heaven and earth to to, to ship something in a very short amount of time. Uh, like I, uh, like Dave said, the initial code base was hacked uh, from from Maker Gear software. So Maker Gear manufactures 3D printers. Been doing so for about 10 years out of Cleveland, Ohio, and uh, it just so happened that Maker Gear had some software for remotely monitoring uh, 3D printers. And as it turns out, a uh, 3D printer is an awful lot like a, a do-it-yourself uh, ventilator. A uh, 3D printer has an uh, Arduino and a Raspberry Pi, and a ventilator has an Arduino and a Raspberry Pi. So uh, we were able to adapt and, and fork the software to, to, to quickly meet the needs um, um, uh, of, the, uh, of the pandemic. So this is the overall architecture here. Uh, so you'll see the dashboard is what we saw before. The dashboard is the, the, the kind of central brains, if you will. Uh, all information flows towards the dashboard. Um, so uh, this is the clinician interface here. Uh, so the dashboard is gonna get its uh, status data in real time from the ventilators. Uh, you'll see three ventilators displayed down here. Each ventilator uh, is in a different configuration. Um, and you'll see the cloud up here. So the cloud is, is, is there only to serve up the application uh, to the browser, and the cloud it doesn't store patient data. Uh, the cloud simply stores um, uh, configuration data for the app, a very limited amount of data. We don't send patient data to the cloud. Um, so how does the dashboard get its information from each of the ventilators? It was kind of a tricky problem for us because each ventilator, uh, there are a number of different types of these DIY ventilators out, out there, and we wanted to make a universal system to pull data from every ventilator. Some ventilators are controlled by uh, an Arduino. Uh, one of the MIT designs was controlled by an Arduino. Um, some ventilators were controlled uh, by a Raspberry Pi. I think the Jamvent design uh, used that. And then some ventilators are a little different, uh, so we wanted to have a soundier, uh, a separate appliance to, to, to listen uh, to the sound the ventilator is making and then trigger an alarm based on that. In order to interface with all these different types of ventilators, we decided to put a Raspberry Pi uh, in between the, each ventilator and the dashboard. Uh, as, so the Raspberry Pi could serve as a kind of universal network interface. Uh, and on the Raspberry Pi, we have a, a, a library. Uh, and so we can write modules for this library to, to basically uh, ingest data from any any system. So uh, the system we set up, the dashboard we set up, can basically take take data from pretty much any device with, with any output capability. If it's a serial out, if it's a, a spy or a UART out or, 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 or whatever, analog out, digital, we, we can take that data from the ventilator and relay it to our dashboard here. Uh, so this is the overall architecture. Um, and the, the specific instance that we tested in the lab uh, was this particular architecture here. Um, so the ventilator is obviously going to be in the patient's room. Uh, and then also in the patient's room uh, is the soundier device, which uh, listens for an audio alarm uh, from, from the ventilator. So the ventilator is going to emit a beep, and you'll hear this in the demo. It's going to emit a beep. The soundier is going to detect that audio beep, that sound pressure. If the sound pressure is above a certain level, it's going to send a signal to the Raspberry Pi, the network adapter, and then the Raspberry Pi is going to then send the alarm to the to the dashboard that we saw earlier. Um, uh, the nice we should note here that we used uh, the zero tier software defined defined network, um, which provides a, a very secure um, uh, network uh, in the hospital and even outside of the hospital if we if we need to uh, to provide connectivity between the Raspberry Pi. And, and, um, and the interface here. And of course, you've got the cloud here. And again, we're, we're not storing patient data on the cloud. Uh, the cloud is just there to serve up um, uh, the, the static assets, the application, if you will, to the dashboard, and also very limited configuration information. Um, and again, this is what the, the nurse is going to see at, at his or her station right here, um, that the dashboard. Software stack, we're getting a little bit into the weeds here. Um, we try to use as much open source uh, software as we could here. Ruby on Rails, uh, reliable, secure, open source, very quick to deploy. Um, Raspberry Pis and Arduinos, uh, again, open source, off the shelf, uh, quick, quick to deploy. Um, 
and then uh, everything uh, we did is, is open source under a GPL uh, v3 license. So you can pretty much use it for whatever purpose uh, you'd like. Um, GPL3 is a uh, very permissive license. Um, uh, you can use it for commercial and or non-commercial. Uh, we wanted hospitals to be, to be able to use this uh, very quickly. Uh, and you see our GitHub link uh, here below. Everything we have is, is up on GitHub. Um, did a lot of testing, uh, at-home testing, workbench testing. We did uh, lab testing. Uh, we did not get to the point where we actually tested it uh, in a hospital, but we did a lot of lab testing in a clinical lab, and uh, it actually worked uh, pretty well. Uh, it worked very well, and we got a very solid uh, proof of concept uh, alpha. Uh, we didn't quite make it through the beta phase, but we got a pretty good alpha uh, prototype. So one of the lessons we learned was uh, the, the validation and the regulatory process was actually very involved, uh, as you might imagine, from medical product. Uh, so mo a lot of us come from a typical software development background, and uh, um, uh, but a medical device has a has a much more involved uh, regulatory and approval pro documentation process. Uh, we just wanted to give you a, a flavor of what that is right here. So the main three documents uh, are the uh, the requirements, which have to be formatted uh, in, in a certain way, the architecture, uh, which again needs to be formatted in a certain way, and then the hazard analysis, which is pretty involved. Basically, for the hazard analysis, we had to brainstorm every possible way that this product might fail. You'd either fail to communicate an alarm to the central station, or um, you, or, or fail in some other way. Uh, so, in every method, we we, we um, we predicted that it might fail, we had to put a contingency plan in place for it. So uh, very detailed, again, I uh, just wanted to give you a brief overview um, of, of, of what this, uh, for those of you who haven't done a medical product before, uh, just a brief overview of, of what that involves. It's a very a rigorous uh, process to prepare for FDA approval uh, and hospital approval. So just a little taste of that right here. Uh, and again, this is the detailed software architecture. Uh, if you want to take a look at that, uh, all these documents are up on our, our GitHub wiki, uh, so you can check those out there uh, for, for details. Um, uh, another important thing here to do is uh, to do a secure code review um, uh, to, to just kind of get a good confidence level, since this is potentially a, a critical application that uh, you know, we don't want to fail. Uh, the staff at uh, MITRE uh, did, a, did a very nice job and uh, lent their support, uh, so we're very uh, grateful to them. Uh, they used uh, uh, an automated code service called Veracode and also a manual code review. Um, still ongoing, but uh, they were a big help with that. Uh, just to give you a taste of um, the automated code review, uh, this was a code review on, 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 I think, a Ruby on Rails portion of the application. Uh, basically, you said uh, you see here we don't have any uh, se severe um, alerts, but we had a couple of um, a, a couple of medium alerts. This was generated from some uh, we had some automated uh, testing code that spit out uh, uh, automated uh, test data. So uh, we need to remove that before deployment. So one little uh, minor thing here. So a few things to fix. Uh, manual code review, um, again, just a few things, nothing uh, critical, a few things to fix. Uh, so we just want to let, uh, just kind of give a little insight to how, how we, we went about uh, testing and validating our code. We learned a lot in this project. We, we did have a few medical experts on our staff, uh, both uh, from the software development side and uh, a lot of medical experts in the regulatory and healthcare field. But a lot of us were software developers. so. It, these are some of the lessons we learned. Um, the most inspiring thing, I, I think, was we, we had a lot of world-class experts uh, to come together very quickly to donate their time, their nights and weekends, and, and um, to, to really come together and, and you know and work for this good cause. You know, um, so that was really inspiring. Um, the biggest hurdles we found were not necessarily the technology. As, a, as technologists, we found it. You know, I don't want to say it was easy, but um, uh, the technology was the easiest part uh, in a lot of ways. The validation and approval w were much more rigorous and time involved than we anticipated. Um, all that being said, FDA approval is, is daunting, but it's not impossible. And there are experts out there that are, that are willing to help. And that's what we found. Uh, a lot of really good um, uh, people with a lot of deep FDA experience out there that are, that are willing to help. Uh, so 
it's it's not undoable. Um, um, uh, we found it's very important to uh, to be aware of uh, HIPAA and, and personal identif identifiable information. Uh, so that's one reason we we chose not to send patient data to the cloud. Um, uh, it's very important to be, be cognizant of HIPAA. Um, another important lesson we learned was that uh, you know hospitals are reluctant to use uh, open source software without the strong backing of an organization to own the um, the technical support and, and, uh, and the, the liability aspect of it. So um, uh, in the future, we're looking for potentially a sponsor uh, for the project to, to, to kind of own that deployment and, and technical support aspect. And ultimately, we learned uh, we didn't have a ventilator shortage in the US, which was great news. So ultimately, our software uh, was not needed. Um, we're very happy that we could uh, be there and kind of rise to the nation's call as an insurance policy, but ultimately uh, there were plenty of ventilators uh, for, from what the experts tell us uh, in the U.S. to go around to uh, for people needing them. Um, okay, so FDA approval. Uh, we just wanted to give you a, a little flavor of, of, of kind of the difficulties we found in the FDA approval process. Um, Big disclaimer, I'm not a lawyer or a medical expert, you know, so please don't take us as medical advice or legal advice, uh, you know, speak, seek expert advice for your own project. Uh, but um, it's just a high level overview of some of the things I learned. Uh, in a normal, in a normal time frame, non-COVID, non-emergency time frame, say last year, uh, a typical approval process for a system like ours would be about two to three years. Uh, it's a lengthy submission progress process, and once you get that uh, approval process, you can use your product uh, for, for, you know, uh, for, for a long period of time. During the emergency, uh, for example, the COVID emergency, a couple, the FDA uh, allows a, a couple types of, of new uh, approvals. Uh, one is what's called an EAU, emergency use authorization. Typically, it can be fast-tracked in two to three months. It's much quicker, uh, but uh, EAU is only valid for the duration of the emergency. Uh, so, uh, if we were to get EAU for uh, our software system, we would not be able to use it after the COVID emergency. And then compassionate use uh, is potentially even quicker. Um, and, and, and that's a, uh, I'm not an expert on that, but it's a slightly quicker process, even more limited in, in, in scope, uh, even more limited in approval, but potentially quicker. So. Um, uh, again, not a legal expert, not a medical expert, but these are just some of the things I, I uh, that, that we learned in the process. Um, there was even a little bit of discussion as to how to classify our software system. Is this a medical device? Is it a modification to an existing medical device, or is it not a medical device? Is it a baby monitor or a pager or, or, or like a cell phone type device? There, so we did have some ongoing debate about that. Um, um, so current status of the project, uh, we've drafted up our validation documents for approval. Um, we have a working demo, proof of concept, I call it an alpha, it works, we tested in the lab, we had a code review. Uh, we do not currently have a customer for the, for the project. Uh, our project is currently parked, uh, so um, uh, if, uh, if uh, you have a potential use for the software, uh, do, do let us know. Uh, we would love to see our software be, be used. Um, for, for a good purpose. Uh, future plans. Um, one thing we discussed is additional audio alerting at the central nursing station that may require, uh, in addition to the visual alerting that we already have, that may require a uh, separate hardware appliance um, and uh, potential AI uh, machine learning to, uh, to, to detect different types of audio alarms from different types of medical devices. Uh, we, we're going to search uh, continually for, for new customers. Um, uh, potential customers may be uh, hospitals with limited resources, uh, smaller hospitals in remote areas uh, or developing countries, um, uh, and then potentially uh, healthcare organizations with needs to monitor other devices uh, like uh, pulse oximeters or things like that. And uh, we're continuing our search for a corporate sponsor, uh, an entity to own the maintenance, installation, uh, support, and liability. Uh, so we're just a group of uh, distributed open source uh, software developers. Uh, uh, we, we don't have an organization behind us. Um, uh, and, and then uh, potentially future 
FDA application uh, again if we find a customer for this. Um, uh, so Dave's going to talk a little bit uh, about uh, the power and the, and the possibilities. Yeah, so when you think about this system, the real power is in the possibilities of all the integrations that this system can provide. You have rapid prototype ventilator monitoring systems that we've discussed, such as bringing in device and patient data. You have commercial ventilators that are not traditionally integrated with central monitoring systems that you can monitor through sound. So you can get ventilator alarms from commercial ventilators. And now with the sound monitoring, you can monitor any medical device alarm that is based in audio. So you think about all the infusion pumps or other devices that you have all throughout your hospital or remote care sites that potentially do not have integrations into your central monitoring system. This could be huge. So this project has great potential to have a massive impact in the healthcare ecosystem. Now for the fun part, we get a live hardware demo. Uh, so we're gonna, we're gonna show you the system uh, in operation. Uh, so Dave in um, Massachusetts has uh, what would be in, in the patient room. What you see on, on this picture, is what's on the bench here in Massachusetts. So the, the way you're gonna see in the video is gonna be from that camera that you see in the forefront of the picture. So you have the speaker in the background next to the cyber lizard who has a microphone next to the speaker. That microphone is plugged into the sound ear. The sound ear is then going to calculate the sound pressure and it has a what's called a soundbuster port. That soundbuster port changes voltage if the audio alarm pressure is tripped. So then the soundbuster port comes out of the sound ear into this Raspberry Pi, and then the Raspberry Pi itself will then go out through the network cable over to a switch that's on my bench here, out over the open internet through the encrypted zero tier tunnel over to Sam where he's running the dashboard. And what I'm going to be doing also is running a ventilator recording of the audio alarm that we used to train this system. So Dave, you've got the ventilator system, you've got the patient side system in Massachusetts. I'm in Ohio. I've got the clinician dashboard. On my clinician dashboard here, I can see a green box, which means I'm able to get a good signal uh, from 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 Dave's device in Massachusetts. Uh, again, all this is communicating over the zero tier secured network. Uh, we're across the, the, the country. We might as well be across the floor uh, in the same hospital. Uh, but I'm getting a good signal back here uh, from Dave's uh, ventilator. And if Dave, if you want to go ahead and trigger the, uh, your alarm there, we should see uh, an alarm indicated here. There we go. So flashing red means uh, the nurse at their dashboard needs to go in and uh, check the patient room. And as soon as we shut it off, the alarm should go off uh, as well. Okay, so that's our uh, that's our demo. So uh, like you see, it, it's a basic working system. It's uh, it's um, you know it, it's fairly simple at this point, but we do have the capability to monitor up to forty ventilators from from one dashboard and it's extensible. So uh, we have libraries uh, that, we could, that could easily incorporate uh, any number of devices. Pretty much any device that's got some kind of hardware, digital or analog output, we can tie this into, into our system. Um, very, very uh, adaptable system. So just some acknowledgements uh, for all of our developers. I was really honored to, to, to be a part of a team of uh, so many people much smarter than, than myself. Um, re really fun to, and, and, and really great to work with this team. Uh, Dave and I led the project, but uh, we have a bunch of other uh, open source contributors here. Everybody volunteered their time and, and effort uh, and sacrificed their nights and weekends to really just uh, um, you know contribute to the COVID cause. So. Uh, um, you know, words can't express my, my appreciation for, uh, for, for everyone's time and effort here. R really inspired to see so many people come together on such a short, a short time. Frame. So thanks to everybody. Uh, organizations here, I uh, just want to thank all the organizations, uh, GHS and FDA for their infrastructure and, and, and their, their funding. Uh, Maker Gear for contributing development time from a number of uh, engineers and, and also open sourcing uh, the, the 
code uh, base and um, contributing hardware resources. Uh, Massachusetts General Hospital and their affiliates uh, for everything they've done and expertise they've provided. Um, MITRE for its code review and consulting and just expertise and, and late night phone calls. Uh, Protocol Labs for um, special thanks for contributing some funding. Uh, Soundier. Um, so we contacted Soundier to um, they're the manufacturers of our, our sound interface device, and uh, we, we asked them for help on a very short time frame, and they were incredibly supportive. Not only did they give us technical support, engineering consultation, they open sourced a portion of their code for us, and you'll see that on GitHub. So uh, I cannot have, uh, I cannot imagine a, a, a better response from a, a manufacturer in a time of crisis. They were incredibly forthcoming, and I cannot thank them enough for helping us to integrate their, their device into our system. Uh, and then last uh, but not least, uh, Vericode for their automated uh, security review. So uh, if you would like to become a contributor or a customer or a sponsor, um, you know, please uh, reach out to us. You can find uh, me or Dave on LinkedIn. And uh, I just want to uh, um, give an extra shout out to, to everybody who worked on this project and an extra thanks to, to everyone. It was really uh, inspiring to see. Uh, so many people involved in this and in, in such a selfless way. So uh, it really gives me a, a hope for the future uh, that we can really nip this thing in the bud. Uh, so, so thanks to everyone.